When you're the new resident in a nursing home, it's a little like being the new kid in school. Or the new prisoner in the penitentiary, I suppose. Depending on how you look at it. I chose to view it as the former, and was happy when a friendly face popped into my room on the first day there. Welcome to Harmony Lake, she said, smiling warmly. The woman was using a wheelchair and looked relatively young to be living in such a place. She was a short woman with a shaved head, a long scar running across the top of it. I guess she was in her mid-sixties. I'm Deborah, but everybody here calls me Deb. She held out a green gift bag, and I took it, saying thank you with genuine surprise in my voice. I hadn't expected this at all, and the kind gesture brought a tear to my eye despite the mundane nature of it all. Inside the bag were coupons, flameless candles, and toiletries, as well as a t-shirt and a deck of playing cards. I'm the unofficial welcome wagon of this dump. <laughs> nice to meet you, I'm John. That's really nice of you, thanks. It's nothing, just some crap from Dollarama down the block. That's about all we got around here nearby. It's not like they give me a budget or anything, I just go out and buy the stuff myself. The cheapskates who own this place wouldn't fork over two cents to bust the Pope out of prison. Chuckling, I thanked her again for generosity. So, speaking of the slammer, how did you end up in here anyways? She asked. You don't look quite as feeble as some of the others in a place like this. I could tell she was a card already and couldn't help but take an immediate shine to her. Well, you look pretty spry yourself. A hell of a lot healthier than me, I'll bet. Uh, never smoked a day in my life, but wouldn't you know I caught damp COPD now. It's probably going to kill me one of these days. Will kill me if something else doesn't do the job first. I had to take a few deep, wheezing breaths before I could finish my thought. The inhalers were still packed up somewhere in a Ziploc bag. I ignored the strangled, rattling sound coming from my chest and fought through it, telling myself I needed to cut down. Stuff is making me so jittery lately. To be honest, it's going to be a relief having other folks around. I had a fall a few months back and couldn't make it to my phone. Almost died on the living room floor and would have if my neighbor hadn't come by to check on me. My breathing's so bad these days I get winded just walking to the bathroom. I left out the fact that I wasn't there by choice. My only son, who lived down in Florida, had made the decision for me after I was admitted to the hospital with a broken hip. I missed my apartment already. My eyes kept going to the bed on the other side of the room where somebody else would be sleeping, just a few feet away from me. I wondered what they would be like, but didn't want to sound like a gossip, so I didn't ask. Well, we're happy to have you here. It's nice to have another person who you can actually talk to. We chatted for a little while longer, and then Deb said she would head back to her room so I could finish unpacking my things. I got the feeling she was just being polite, since I was clearly struggling to keep up the conversation on my end. It had been a long day, and the cold weather wasn't helping anything. I decided that I would need the rescue inhaler after all, and would use it right after she left. Just as she was about to go, she said one last thing that stuck with me. Listen, I don't want to scare you, but I feel like I have to tell you. This is a good place. It really is, but there's a dark side to it as well. Just be careful. And watch out for Gwendolyn, the PSW. I can't talk about it too much, but just try to stay on her good side. And whatever you do, don't let her touch you. Without another word, she rolled out of the room and was gone, leaving me in stunned silence. Watch out for Gwendolyn, the PSW. Don't let her touch you? What in the world did that mean? It, it sounded like she was scared of one of the staff members in the nursing home. 
I debated going straight to the nurse at the desk, but decided to hold off until after I had spoken to Deb again. An hour later, I met Gwendolyn, the PSW. That's personal support worker, for those of you out there who are unfamiliar with the abbreviation. Essentially, it means a nurse's aide. She was a middle-aged woman with bleached blonde hair and dark bags under her eyes. Her ill-fitting scrubs had pictures of cartoon princesses all over them, and her face was plastered with far too much makeup. She walked in carrying a bag of chips, which she proceeded to eat in front of me, while speaking with her mouth full. She talked loudly, spraying masticated chip crumbs into the air occasionally. John, how you doing today? You settling in? I see. Good, that's so good. Listen, I heard you were talking with Deb. And okay, let me tell you. That lady is a total wacko. Anything she says, you gotta just like in one ear, out the other. Just ignore it. You can ask anyone. She's got this compulsive lying streak. Especially if it's about me, because seriously, she totally hates me for some reason. I wasn't really sure what to say or who to believe, but it wasn't her. When people start a conversation by telling you your newest friend is a pathological liar and mentally unstable to boot, it usually doesn't give a good first impression. I just said, okay. Ignoring my body language and polite attempts to ask for privacy, she went over to my dresser and began to pick up my things and look at them. Pictures of my family, my books, and heirlooms. She grabbed them and put them back crooked. Or in the wrong place entirely. Everything she touched, I saw the greasy stain from her fingertips on afterwards, and she began to lick her fingers clean from the grease and salt of the chips before moving on to my books, which she started to paw at next. I remembered Deb's advice and decided I should at least be decent with her, despite my growing disgust since we were likely going to be around each other a lot. As much as it pained me, I gave her a small smile and tried to talk with her about something mundane, hoping I would lure her away from my bookshelf before she could breach my treasured first editions. I didn't know what I would do if she tried to touch me, but the mere thought of it terrified me now for reasons I still didn't understand. Uh, It's nice to meet you, Gwendolyn. Have you worked here long? I managed to say, trying to kill her with kindness, as I had always been taught to do. Just making polite conversation, I thought. She raised her eyebrows and laughed in response, as if the mere thought of me trying to converse with her as an equal was a hilarious joke to her. Oh, I've worked here for a long, long time. I know the boss upstairs. We're close. Real, real close. Her eyes seemed to shimmer a shade bluer as she spoke, and I found myself no longer wanting to question her. I began to feel very tired as she looked into my eyes and wanted badly to go to sleep. She looked away, and the feeling vanished. As if she could tell exactly which book was my favorite, Gwendolyn picked up my copy of Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and started flipping through it with her greasy hands. Even from where I was sitting, I could see the stains she was leaving all over the pages. She threw it haphazardly onto the bed and walked out of the room without saying another word, crumpling up and tossing her now-empty bag of chips towards a small garbage can on the way out. The bag drifted lazily down to the floor, and she took a glance at it and left it there. Well, fuck me. I rolled my eyes and walked over to the garbage can, picked up the bag, and threw it in the bin. When I looked up, she was standing there in the doorway to my room as if she had never left. Did you say something? I thought I heard you say something. No? She glared at me with her cold blue eyes for a second, her hands up on the doorframe on either side. Now that I was standing in front of her, I noticed how tall she was, at least six foot. I didn't think so. We're going to get along like gangbusters, you and me. I can tell already, John. 
I bit my tongue and nodded, watching in frustration as she walked off. I heard her two doors down yelling in an artificially cheery tone as another unfortunate resident responded timidly to her. At least she hadn't tried to touch me. Later that evening, I asked Deb about the whole no-touching thing. Shh, not in here. I'll tell you later on, she told me conspiratorially. Gwendolyn walked by just after that, and I noticed her scowling in Deb's direction. The nurse came over and asked me if everything was all right, and I said it was. Although I had an inkling that was going to prove to be a lie. Later that evening, we were back in my room. My roommate was out somewhere, and this actually afforded us some rare degree of privacy. Although they didn't allow us to close the door to the room because of safety precautions. Can you finally tell me what's going on? She was in here earlier. I could tell there was something off about her, but I couldn't tell what it was. I was already beginning to forget how I felt when she looked into my eyes, that memory fading like a dream upon waking. Deb sighed and looked at me, shaking her head. I want to tell you I do, but I'm afraid of how you're going to react. It's going to sound nuts. I'll keep an open mind. Come on, just tell me. The worst I'll say is that I don't believe you. She looked at me for a few seconds and then told me her theory. You wouldn't be the first person to tell me I'm crazy, but I'm not. The ones who didn't believe me, they ended up regretting it. Listen, whatever you do, don't let her touch you. Find any excuse you can think of. For a few moments, I tried to gauge if this was some prank or if she actually believed that Gwendolyn had some sort of evil supernatural power. Tell me more. It was a while before anything transpired between Gwendolyn and myself. But when things did come to a head, everything happened so fast. Looking back on the time after I arrived at Harmony Lake up until the incident, it was the calm before the storm. But all the while, the pressure had been building up. In the following months after moving in, I made friends around the place pretty quickly. There was Reggie, a tall, well-spoken British fellow who was a jokester and full of stories from his war days, flying bomber jets. Tabitha, a woman who walked with a cane and a slight limp, organized the weekly bingo on Friday nights. I didn't mention Deb's theory directly to them, but instead asked what they thought of Gwendolyn in the PSW. Uh, She's a bit of a slob, but other than that, I don't know much about her, said Tabitha one afternoon as we were sitting in the lounge. Reg and I are pretty independent, so we, we don't really deal with the PSWs too much, except the odd time when we need a hand with something silly, warming up a cup of coffee or getting some toiletries from the supply room. I've heard she's always working with the sickest residents, the ones who die just a few days or weeks later. This matched up exactly with Deb's theory, at least it seemed to. Although I talked to Reggie and Tabitha and a few other residents, Deb and I became very close. I'd go watch TV in her room with her some nights, or we'd just sit and chat after dinner, getting to know each other better and regaling each other with stories from our pasts. My roommate during all this time was a lonesome woman named Elizabeth, who refused to be nice to anyone, and seemed jaded and angry about her place in the world and where she had ended up. She was in her early 50s, and I found out she was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. Her belly was swollen and distended, causing her great discomfort, and she complained bitterly about the staff neglecting her, despite it seeming to me like they spent more time with her than almost anyone. I tried to say kind things to her and cheer her up. Would bring her ginger ales and coffee, made just how she liked it. Five cream, six sugars. Blech. But her responses to my gestures were always cutting and sarcastic, and possibly negative. So I eventually began speaking with her less and less, and started trying to avoid her. Does that make me a bad person? I suppose maybe it does. 
Still, she would see me walking by on my way to the dining room. Since my bed was nearest the window and hers was by the door, I had no choice but to walk past her. And she would stop me and hold me up to rant on about her absent family and the incompetent staff members at Harmony Lake. I realized quickly that she was a world-class narcissist and had no interest in anyone but herself. Not only that, but she never stopped talking. Always going on and on about self-obsessed drivel. So I decided to mostly try and avoid her. I'm sorry if that sounds terrible. She was toxic, though. The more I got to know her, the more obvious it was to me. There was something dark inside of her. Something evil and spiteful had possessed her at some point. This must sound ludicrous, the idea that two evil presences lived within the same nursing home together, but I found out that it was true. Both Gwendolyn and Elizabeth were possessed by things not of this world. And on top of that, they were both woefully ignorant of each other's presence. It makes sense, I suppose. If you were a demon set loose on Earth and you wanted to go somewhere quiet and neglected where you wouldn't be noticed, a nursing home seems like quite a reasonable option. With all the issues people have in these places, a demon-possessed raving maniac would hardly even be noticed, especially on some units that specialize in those types. As it happened, Gwendolyn volunteered to take on the role of caring for Elizabeth as her health declined. I watched her carefully when she came into the room, observing for any signs of what Deborah had suggested. But she always made sure to close the curtains, and never did anything untoward, at least as far as I could tell. It was towards the very end that I could tell Elizabeth was going to go. The thing inside of her would have to find another host soon, since the poor woman's body was about to give up. The PSWs and nurses were making their rounds more and more frequently, speaking in hushed tones about how she would be going soon. The woman's breathing had become shallow and sporadic, her face a grayish-yellow jaundiced mask of death, her eyes barely opening and never speaking or moving anymore except to scream when they turned her trying to prevent bed sores. Gwendolyn was in there with her one night had closed the door and drawn the curtains around them, and I tried to figure out how I could observe them without being seen. I waited for the right moment, and got into my bed from the chair at the window, moving as quietly as I could so Gwendolyn would still think I was by the window, unable to see. Pulling back the curtain ever so slightly with my foot, I saw Gwendolyn hunched over Elizabeth and an eerie blue glow was emanating from her eyes. She had her mouth open wide and was holding it over Elizabeth's, the faint blue glow of her eyes casting the woman green when combined with the yellow of her jaundiced flesh. I watched for as long as I dared, then closed the curtain again. My breathing suddenly labored and wheezing. What I had just seen terrified me. For I knew now that what Deb had warned me of was true. I had only suspected it before, but now it was undeniable. On? Gwendolyn's voice from the other side of the curtain sent shivers down my spine. Suddenly I was feeling palpitations in my chest, my heart pounding like an offbeat drum. What did you see, John? I saw her silhouette pull back the curtain as she moved towards me, and my heart hammered faster and faster as she pulled the curtain back even further. Her pale blue eyes were glowing eerily as she looked at me, shaking her head. Tsk, tsk, John. You shouldn't be spying on your neighbors. Now I'll have to make sure you can't tell anyone. No. Please, no. I, I, I won't say anything. I felt my will to fight diminishing as she stared at me with her cold eyes. Lay down on the bed, John. I did as she told me. Despite the protests of my mind, my body seemed unwilling or unable to comply with anything except for the commands of Gwendolyn, the PSW. 
Laying down, I looked up at the ceiling and awaited my fate. But the next moment I felt free again, as if I was no longer under her control. I looked up at her and saw her eyes were not blue anymore, but green. She stood there, twitching. Her body began to rock back and forth as if she were having a seizure. Gwendolyn's eyes, filled with blood, began to pour and stream out from them and drip down to the floor. I could see the war now, going on inside of her. The thing that had been inside Elizabeth was so narcissistic that it had not noticed the being that lived inside of Gwendolyn, and vice versa. The two demons, or whatever they were, were now locked in a battle to the death inside the one remaining host. Gwendolyn had consumed Elizabeth's spirit, and with it she had taken the thing that lived inside of her. The woman's body began to violently heave and bloat, her body distended and massive one moment, then her arms becoming edematist and breaking open in long, sloughing gashes. Her flesh started to melt and sizzle and poured off her bones. Her gleaming white skull revealed as the fat and muscle began to rip and run and drip like candle wax. She began to scream, the pitch rising higher and higher. Then she collapsed into a puddle on the floor, which smoked and reeked of sulfur. I got up and jumped over it, running to the door, worried about what would happen if I breathed in that smoke. Now there were two demons running around, looking for a host. And I had just seen what happens if they pick the same one. Lunamort Manor. The towering castle stood before me, vast and ancient, gargantuan and looming. Dark clouds swirling above threatened rain, and I heard thunder crash in the distance as the ocean seemed to swell and heave around me on all sides. White caps appeared on water that had been still and serene just minutes before. It had darkened as well to match the sky, and now looked inky black as I watched the ferry disappear into the distance. Made of grey stone, the place had a medieval look that reminded me of a fortress from a horror movie, with turrets and a winding stone staircase leading up to a wide porch at the entrance. The impending storm reinforced the illusion that this was the home of some monster mad scientist and I heard the thunder clap again louder this time closer I trudged up the stairs my arms already tired from the weight of suitcases packed full my legs heavy with fatigue it had been a long journey to get here once I got to the top of the stairs the elevated view showed how alone I truly was nothing but ocean on all sides the waves and white caps now looking tiny in the distance down below. What if nobody was home? My heart began to pound as rain started to patter and then pour from the sky in fat drops and thunder boomed now directly overhead, causing me to jump and let out a startled cry of terror. I was about to announce my arrival, my hand reaching up for the large black cast iron knocker molded to look like a bat. When the tall wooden slat doors opened up before me, there was no one behind them, I saw. As I entered the vast and echoing entrance chamber, I assumed they had observed my arrival on hidden security cameras, because I hadn't seen anyone since getting off the ferry. Suits of armor, giant Renaissance paintings, ancient artifacts and sculptures adorned the grand foyer, and yet everything was dusty and cloaked in shadow. Swords were mounted on the walls and places in a black grand piano sat in one corner, looking neglected and disrepair. 
The black and white checkerboard floors beneath my feet were similarly dirty and in need of a polish. Hello? Anybody home? It had been a long ferry ride to the island, and the boat had been lacking a washroom. I was getting desperate and wanted to get the pleasantries with my new boss over with as quickly as possible so that I could visit the facilities, should we say. How do you ask someone you just met if you can go number two in their bathroom? This had the potential for awkwardness, I thought to myself as my stomach churned and rumbled loudly as if to agree. Good evening. A tall, gaunt man with pale skin and black hair appeared in the shadows on the balcony above as if from nowhere. His voice was deep and accented, though where the accent was from I could not place. Eastern European, perhaps? But more specific than that, I could not say. The shadows absorbed his face before I could get more than the briefest of glimpses. I saw him in the darkness to my right a moment later. He had gotten there much faster than was humanly possible. This caused me to recoil and let out a slightly shrill cry for the second time in less than a minute. My apologies, my dear, if I frightened you. He stepped out of the shadows and began to walk towards me, taking slow, deliberate steps. His hands were behind his back, and when I looked into his eyes, I saw no light there, no glimmer of reflection to indicate humanity. Only a dull black that absorbed all light and drew me in like a moth to the flame. I trust that your journey was... Wait a minute. He came closer to expect me. Uh, You're... You're a guy. I was expecting a woman. I'm sorry, a what? A woman. You're a man. I looked down at myself and shrugged. Uh, Last I checked. You are a man. And a nanny? You are the new nanny? (laughs) Yeah, I get that a lot. I've heard all the jokes, so, uh, sometimes they call me a Manny. <laughs> but it's all good. Hey, do you mind if I use your wash? No, no, no. This will not do at all. I will have to call that damn agency again. I'm sorry, but this is not going to work out. Suddenly, from the shadows to my right, two young girls seemed to float towards me. Their legs not moving and their feet appearing not to touch the ground. Their skin was pale, and they were wearing matching black dresses, their hair done up in pigtails. Daddy, Daddy, is this our new nanny? What's his name, Daddy? Is he a human, Daddy? Can we give him a tour? Can we? They were twins, I realized quickly, and they appeared malnourished, judging by their red eyes with dark bags under them. They were pale and extremely thin as well. I'm sorry, girls. There's been some mistake. We'll have to wait for a few days for a new nanny to come. This man was just about to leave. But why, Daddy? What's wrong with him? The two of them began to stamp their feet on the dirty floor, sending dust motes into the air. This caused my throat and sinuses to become irritated, and I began to cough. The coughing fit, which resulted, had the unfortunate effect of causing me to loudly pass wind in front of my new boss and his two daughters. I couldn't help it, it just slept out. It was a real squeaker, too. This caused the twins to absolutely lose their minds. They thought it was hysterical for some reason that I just farted within moments of arriving. Listen, I really needed to use the bathroom. (laughs) Sorry about that. He's funny, Daddy. Can we keep him, please? The man looked annoyed. He huffed and glared daggers at me, but then relented. It was pretty obvious who ran the show around here. All right. We will let him stay on a trial basis. He lowered his voice. You really should have told me you weren't a lady before you came. Highly unprofessional. Sorry. 
I suppose it is a bit of a unisex name, though, isn't it? Jordan? <laughs> I should have seen this one coming. It's Jordan, actually, but yeah, I, I guess I've met a few ladies with that name. Anyways, I'm glad you're willing to give me a shot. I really need this job, to be honest. Right, sure. Tough times and all that. Okay, follow me. I will show you to your room. He muttered something under his breath and hurried away as I tried to keep up. Strangely, his shadows took a second or two longer to exit the room, as if they had a life of their own, and were simply mocking his movements. They danced and capered on the walls and ceiling, procrastinating until he was well down the hallway. Actually, if you could point me in the direction of a bathroom, this way, Mr. Group, hurry on now, don't delay. We haven't got all day. Right, okay. Coming. I hurried after him, clenching my sphincter. We arrived at a door on the upper level, and he opened it and shoved me inside rudely. This will be your quarters for the foreseeable future. I'll let you get settled. But I really need to... He slammed the door shut, and I heard it lock from the outside. Shit. The next few hours passed slowly. Eventually, I stopped sweating and trembling, and the terrible feeling like gerbils trying to claw their way out of my belly went away. I really need to stop eating vending machine chili. A new concern began to replace that feeling, and I realized my body was probably switching out of the whole rest and digest portion of subconscious autonomic functioning, and was now fully engaged in fight or flight. Essentially, my body had decided that whatever gastrointestinal issues I was having, they were nothing compared to the imminent probability of death, at least for the time being. This internal decision was likely made without my conscious knowledge after hearing the distant cries and wails and blood-curdling shrieks of someone calling for help from deep within the manor. They seemed to come from below, and could be heard through the window sporadically as well. A few of them were cut short, making me wonder what had happened to cause them to cease mid-scream. Such an interruption is disturbing, and unnatural. If you ever hear it, you'll know what I mean, but it's probably better if you don't. The man came back to the door and knocked briskly twice before entering. What have you been doing in here? You haven't unpacked any of your clothes. Are you going to be wearing that to dinner, really? You didn't bring anything more appropriate than a t-shirt that says, Tool? Is this your formal wear? Suddenly I realized where his twin daughters had gotten their habit of rapid-fire questioning. Listen, I thought I heard screaming from out the window... My voice was trembling, and I tried to control it. Ah, yes. That was... unfortunate. Well, I suppose I should just get this out of the way. Uh, get, get what out of the way? I backed away from him as he approached, his eyes hypnotic and dark, spiraling like whirlpools at night filled with stars at their centers. You have to understand... I can't tell the agency the truth. They would never send another nanny out here if I did. Oh no, please. I have a family. I didn't. Uh, rub it in, why don't you? He stopped and blinked for a moment, then crossed his arms as if giving himself a hug. He took a breath before continuing. I guess you figured it out. I am a single father, all alone out here, on this cursed island. I had secretly hoped that one of my au pairs would fall in love with me, and decide to stay here and be my wife. I know. It's sick. I would be banned from the nanny services if they found out my intentions, but there it is. What? That's your secret? 
I mean, that's not cool at all, not even a little bit, but eh, it's better than what I was expecting. He looked confused. What did you think? What about the screaming? He looked at me, one eyebrow raised. My stomach was beginning to do backflips again now that I had a moment's reprieve from the threat of death. I started to think I was just imagining things. His daughters were just normal kids. They weren't capable of hovering over the ground eerily like phantoms. It was just a trick of the light. And this man was just a normal guy. Sure, it had seemed like he had superhuman speed earlier when he'd come to greet me at the door. And sure, I had just heard blood-curdling screaming off and on for the last three hours. But... Can I please use your washroom? I pour my heart out, and that's all you have to say? <sighs> he breathed heavily. All right, come on, this way. I hurried after him and passed pictures on the walls depicting portraits of prior counts of Lunamort Manor. Their eyes seemed to twitch and follow me as I walked. Alas, all of my forefathers are rolling in their graves, sick to their stomachs at the thought of our line being finished. Ah, here we are, the servant's bathroom. He pointed me into a cobweb-festooned room filled with dingy and tarnished old fixtures, a broken mirror, and very little light to speak of. Once he closed the door behind me, it was practically pitch black but I pressed forward and took a seat on the cold throne that waited for me there. Normally I would feel much better after that, but I left the room feeling as if the world was spinning around in circles and sweat was pouring off of me and dripping on the floor. My stomach still felt like there was a cinder block sitting inside of it as well. I can't remember what happened to me in there, but I have a vague recollection of a severed hand leaking blood and pus that had crawled out of the toilet bowl from between my legs before disappearing into the bathtub. It's hard to do your business after that. But again, the memory was barely there. Fading like a dream upon waking and leaving only bits and pieces, flashes of imagery and feelings. What the hell is this place? I asked Count Lunamort feeling utter despair and terror gripping me again. Why had I agreed to this? This is my ancestral home. Be careful of what you say, for I am not the only one who might hear and take offense. I was about to apologize when the girls came running down the hall towards us, again seeming to materialize from nowhere. Daddy! Hello, girls. It is time for your classes. Go on up to the study, and I will meet you there shortly. The girls protested momentarily, saying they wanted to show me around and give me a tour of the castle, but Count Lunamort would not allow it. I could tell that classroom times were very rigid and inflexible, and was somewhat impressed at his structure as a homeschooling parent, even if the class hours were a bit unorthodox. It was past 7 p.m. and fully dark outside now. You, on the other hand, will go down to the servants' quarters to see my manservant, Geoffrey. He will see that you are fed, and will instruct you on tomorrow's itinerary. I'm having a get-together, and the girls must not be allowed to interrupt. This will be a bit of a test for you, to see if you can handle the job. I nodded my agreement, afraid to upset this man who was suddenly speaking with the stern authority of a lord or duke. Then I remembered that Count was technically a royal title. Forgot about that one. This man was someone who was used to getting his way. Used to getting what he wanted without bickering or any sort of disagreement. Putting my fears at having seen a disembodied hand running around minutes earlier... I told him I would go down to the manservant's quarters and immediately find Jeffrey. He left me there in the upstairs hallway and vanished into the shadows. The glow of dim lamps hanging from wall sconces lit the corridor, and I walked aimlessly, realizing I had no idea where I was going. 
This place was like a maze. I tried to find a staircase going down and eventually spotted one. It was a spiral staircase made of stone that descended down a great distance. The air became moist and chilly by the time I got to the door at the bottom. I was realizing that darkness was a bit of a theme in the manor by that point, as the wall sconces down this way were similarly murky, and it was difficult to see in the light of them. I saw no sign of anyone, but the Count had indicated Jeffrey was in the basement, so I assumed I was on the right track. Pushing open the door, I heard whispered voices and the squeak of rats. The space within appeared to be a dungeon. Ahem. <clears throat> Excuse me. What exactly are you doing down here? I jumped and my heart nearly stopped in my chest as all the hairs on my skin rose up at once. My shock was so severe that I couldn't even scream. I hadn't heard anyone sneak up behind me. The man had been as silent as a ghost. Turning around, I backed up into the door, closing it and shutting off the whispered voices rising to an urgent pitch. S -s Sorry, I I'm the new nanny. H how's it going? I stuck out my hand. Jeffrey, he said, ignoring my pleasantries. And you are not to be allowed down here. This way, follow me. The man was bald and heinous looking, his teeth pointed and sticking out of his mouth with a severe overbite. He wore a black wool trench coat over a three-piece suit with a red tie. Shuffling back up the stairs with a limp, he stopped and looked back at me impatiently. I was still standing in front of the door, unmoving. See that you listen to me, or I'll tell the Count of your insolence. And he doesn't take kindly to disobedience. Make no mistake about that. His eyes shifted unconsciously to the door I had just opened a moment before. I'm right behind you, I said, taking a step forward and up the stairs after him. By the way, I have to ask, do you have any idea where I can find a decent bathroom around this place? As the ship disappeared into the distance, I looked out at the dark, white-capped sea and wondered again why I had neglected to get on board. It wasn't the first time I had chickened out at the last second. The growing waves and swirling black clouds above persuading me to stay on dry land a week prior as well. Before arriving on Lunamort Island, I had never been afraid of the ocean. But now that I was stuck here and surrounded by salt water, I was developing an unhealthy phobia of it. Will you need a hand with your bags again? A dry voice asked from behind me, causing me to jump. Jeffrey, I told you not to do that. Apologies, of course. Your bags. I sighed resignedly and handed him two of the heavy bags, ultimately grateful for his help. He took them and turned around trudging his way up the slippery, winding steps towards Lunamort Manor. Thunder rumbled nearby, and I quickly followed after him, the gothic castle towering over us and casting us in its shadow as we walked. Why can't I leave, Jeffrey? He pretended not to hear me. I ran ahead of him and caught up, throwing my bags down and grabbing his prim-looking three-piece suit roughly by the lapels. His red-rimmed eyes looked stubbornly back into mine. Not relenting. Not giving an inch of ground. Tell me, Jeffrey. Give me something. Anything. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea what you mean, sir. Now, if you please, follow me. The Count will be expecting us. I let go of him instantly. The Count. Mustn't displease the Count. He would be the one to let me out of this place, I realized. I just had to reason with him. 
he hadn't wanted to hire me in the first place. Now I just had to convince him that his instincts were right all along. It wasn't the first time I had tried to get myself fired. I was pretty good at it, admittedly. The incident at the restaurant was particularly mortifying to think about and made me cringe internally whenever I did. Fine. Let's go see him then. I believe there is still a matter of the girl's lessons for today. If you are to stay, you must fulfill your duties here. The Count will insist on that, I can assure you. He began to walk again, not waiting for me to answer. The stone steps became increasingly narrow, steeper, and more treacherous as we got near the top. There, the huge wood-paneled doorway stood waiting, gargoyles guarding it and standing watch looking down from above. Thunder boomed and lightning crashed as rain began to pour from the sky, falling torrentially, deafeningly. Jeffrey put his hand on the door to open it, then stopped. He looked to be deep in thought for a moment. You will have to find a replacement. He'll keep you here, just like he did to me, unless you find someone to take your place. His words were almost lost in the staccato beat of the rainfall, but I heard them just barely. And with that, he opened the door and went inside, not waiting for my response. Finally, I had something to go on. A way out. I just had to find some sucker to take my place. Why hadn't I thought of that? Florina and Elena came running down the steps to greet me at the door, their black hair streaming out behind them. Their shadows followed but were slightly delayed and could be seen capering and dilly-dallying on the walls as if they had minds of their own. You're back, they shouted in unison, running up to me and hugging me. Their smiles were wide, and long canines gleamed as they grinned. We knew you couldn't go. You'd miss us too much. I felt bad, but needed to be honest with them. They were tough and could take it. <sighs> I still have to go, girls. The weather was just really bad again. I'll have to leave with the next supply ship, though. But I'll be here for another week at least, so we can finish reading Animal Farm together. Florina especially loved that book. She liked the pigs in it, and was immediately enamored by the story. I read all the characters' parts in different voices, and she'd always giggle at the pigs' voices especially, and the sheep with their chanting of four legs good, two legs bad. They hurried up to the library where we had our classes together. I told them I'd be right up after I took my bags back to my room. Jeffrey had left them at the door for me to handle the rest of the way, saying he needed to go to the kitchen to assist with preparations for dinner. Just then, I heard the all-too-familiar blood-curdling scream which came through the floor from deep below the castle. I would never get used to those. They always made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It made me wish I was anywhere else. At first I'd convinced myself it was merely the sea winds blowing through a tunnel in the rocks beneath the manor. But after a while, even I didn't believe it anymore. The sounds were too human. The howling screams were coming from the basement of the manor, I was fairly certain. And this was the one place where I was forbidden to go. I knew I needed to help whoever was down there. The Count and Geoffrey had told me exactly what I wanted to hear. That it was indeed the wind blowing through the narrow tunnels beneath the old house. And I had been happy to accept that for a while but no longer. Part of the reason I wanted to flee the island was to get help for whoever was down there. 
a woman was being held prisoner by the Count. I just knew it. Part of me still wanted to try to sneak down there to confirm my suspicions. But it was nearly impossible with Jeffrey sneaking around all the time. He seemed intent on keeping an eye on me, appearing out of nowhere whenever I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. There had to be secret tunnels all over the castle to accommodate such swift movement on his part. It seemed impossible otherwise. After hauling my bags back up to my room, I caught up with the twins and helped them with their studies for a few hours. They also had classes with their father, which were held in secret late into the night. Whenever I asked about what he was teaching them, to figure out if I could skip my weaker subjects like math or whatever he was covering himself, the girls in the count would refuse to enlighten me, only saying that it had to do with family history and things which go bump in the night, whatever that meant. So I did my best with teaching them math, not my strongest subject, and English, which is my strongest subject, as well as art, science, music, I'm also tone deaf, and history, all using the dusty, out-of-date books from the castle library. The girls always exceeded my expectations, regardless of the field of study, and I found them to be quite intelligent and precocious despite their young age and their fondness for childish enjoyments like games and having a story read to them, they acted more like university students most of the time, especially during their studies. I couldn't believe how fast they picked up every aspect of what I taught them, and remembered it flawlessly. Soon they were embarrassing me with my lack of insight into tougher subjects like algebra and trigonometry. It made me realize that I had been on the island for far longer than I had thought. I had only wanted to stay for a few months, and already half a year had passed. I had long been putting off all things that I had been meaning to do, like reporting the screaming abductees in the basement, for instance. That was what prompted me to try to catch the next boat off the island. But alas, it was more difficult than I had foreseen. After my lessons with the girls, we went downstairs to have dinner with the Count. I planned to make my appeal to him afterwards, but not during dinner. That would not go over well, I was sure of it. As I made my way downstairs towards the dining room, I passed the staircase which led to the basement. Jeffrey was busy in the kitchen, I remembered, and wondered if this might be my chance. After sending the girls ahead, I looked over my shoulder to make sure nobody was watching, then proceeded down the spiral staircase which led down to the cellar. The stone steps echoed loudly despite my efforts at stealth, and I braced myself for Jeffrey's sharp, commanding tone to scold me for my actions. But for the first time, no one did. At the bottom of the staircase was a single door, with a barred window at the top strangely left ajar. I was surprised, since the butler was usually so fastidious. I thought of his red-rimmed eyes as he had looked up at me outside, black bags beneath like loaded suitcases. The old man was tired. He had simply forgotten to lock up. I swung the door open slowly, listening to the loud creak it made and wincing at the noise, seeming to resonate, echoing up the staircase and towards the top. Proceeding into the stone-walled room, my heartbeat began to hammer against my ribs. I tried to swallow, but my mouth and throat were so dry I couldn't even manage it. My anxiety began to build as I saw what had been kept hidden below the manor. It was a dungeon. I continued in further and saw half a dozen cells with bars and sturdy locks, all hanging open except for one, the one at the end. Weeping could be heard coming from there, soft and suppressed, as if the woman making the sounds knew she was supposed to be quiet. 
When I got in front of the cell door, I saw her. She was a young woman with tangled chestnut brown hair covered in dirt and grime. Her clothes were simple rags, and my eyes filled with tears to see the conditions she was living in. A dog bowl had been put in one corner, and there was newspaper in the other corner for her to... Well, you get the picture. It was a torturous scene, and I immediately felt awful for her. A key was hanging up on a peg nearby, and without thinking, I went over to it and grabbed it, pulling it down from the hook. My hands were shaking as I bent down to the lock and fumbled, trying to insert it. Wait, she said. Her voice was barely a whisper. That's not a good idea. Who are you? Why is he doing this to you? I asked, ignoring her. I got the key in the lock and turned it, opening the cell door. When it opened, she stood up, looking different suddenly. I saw her eyes were odd. One was blue, the other green. I told you that wasn't a good idea, she said. Hair started growing from her pores, filling her face and arms with fur. She started growing taller, more muscular, and went down on all fours, beginning to growl. I backed away from the cell door, suddenly regretting going down there. What had I been thinking? A massive, growling wolf now stood before me, chestnut brown with tangled, matted fur. It appeared emaciated and lean, but moreover, hungry, famished, starving. It stalked out of its cage on all fours, its breath hot and humid on my face. Drool hung from its long, narrowing jaws as the beast began, growing even larger taller until it loomed over me, a low, rumbling growl coming steadily from within it. It lunged forward, its jaws snapping as it swiped at the air with its tremendous claws, missing me by mere inches as I ducked away. Back! Back, foul beast! Back in your cage! Jeffrey was suddenly there beside me, brandishing a blazing torch and waving it wildly at the werewolf. He started thrusting the flame towards the giant creature like a sword, its, his eyes wide and full of terror. Run! Get out of here! He didn't need to ask me twice. I bolted out of the room and ran back to the base of the staircase. Jeffrey followed a few moments after, running quickly out of the dungeon room and slamming the door shut behind him barring it and locking it as fast as he could. An instant later, snapping jaws were at the barred window, desperately trying to bite our heads off. Luckily, the door was strong. The locks even stronger. I told you not to come down here, Jeffrey said, panting and out of breath, still holding the door behind him with his body weight as it shook and heaved in the frame. A steady, pounding noise interspersed with the ragged, scratching sound of claws scraping wood came from the other side, then finally ceased. Jeffrey backed away from the door and dusted off his hand, looking at me scornfully. Now if you will please, follow me. Dinner is served. It felt as if I couldn't really argue with him. He had just saved my life, after all. We got to the dining room and found that the long, wooden table was already set. It was covered with a dark, vermilion tablecloth embroidered with the Count's family coat of arms. There were lit candelabras and centerpieces of dark purple and red flowers and brass and golden vases, which I had to look over top of to see the Count. Dozens of different plates were arranged on the table. Meats and fish, roasted vegetables, potatoes and mushrooms, gravies and sauces of all sorts. A big, bloody roast was at the center of it all to be carved by Jeffrey. Blood poured from it as he began cutting into the unidentifiable animal. Ah, my two favorite girls and their splendid teacher. 
We had opted for this as my title, since the Count told me that he wanted to find a motherly figure to be a nanny for the girls. I got the feeling he was probably already recruiting someone for that position. It just wasn't easy to find someone willing to travel to this gothic island, castle surrounded by dark, treacherous ocean on all sides. I couldn't possibly imagine why. The four of us sat down and began to eat. As always, the food was delicious. Seasoned and cooked to perfection. Did you have fun down in the dungeon with my other... guest? I had a bite of zucchini in my mouth, and I nearly choked on it as he said this. I managed to swallow it, probably into my lungs, as a coughing fit ensued. Barely able to contain my terror at what he might do, I tried to calm myself down as fast as possible by taking a few sips of water. My eyes darted to Jeffrey, but he had been with me the whole time, so how did the Count know we had been down there? I know all that happens within these walls, and on this island. Nothing is kept secret from me here, he said, as if reading my panicked thoughts. And maybe he was, for all I knew. I finally managed to get over my coughing fit and stared at him uncertainly. The best thing to do, I decided, was to apologize. After all, it was the one place I hadn't been allowed to go. And in retrospect, for good reason. They had actually been trying to protect me from the werewolf girl they had imprisoned in the dungeon. I had tried to save her, and she had tried to kill me. Which made me wonder if perhaps she was down there for a good reason, and quite possibly of her own volition. I'm sorry, you told me not to go down there, and I didn't listen. But I thought someone was in trouble, that you were keeping a woman prisoner down there. Which, I mean, you, you kind of are, but... I realized how that sounded and looked down at the table, feeling strangely ashamed of myself. The girls were looking at me with their jaws hanging down, not believing what was happening. You will leave on the next supply ship. Two weeks from today. I will not have guests or employees who do not abide by the rules of my home. Your replacement will be on board that ship as well, so do not fret about the girls. I have been told she is very well qualified. But, Daddy... Florina and Alina called out in unison. No buts, and you will stop with the weather tampering and your phobia-inducing psychic spellcasting as well, young ladies. His time on this island is finished. You will not interfere with his departure this time. The two girls pouted and avoided eye contact with me. So it had been them the entire time. They had been messing with my mind, using whatever dark magic their father had taught them. Getting me panicked at the sight of the ocean and the stormy weather, which they were also somehow manipulating. This family was a lot more interesting than I had thought, I was beginning to realize. At first, I had just thought maybe they were vampires. Of course they're vampires, you idiot! Jeffrey rolled his eyes and kept cutting at the bloody roast. Hey, uh, can I get a piece of that? I asked, holding up my plate. As rare as you can get it. You know this is a person, right? I set my plate back down on the table and grabbed a piece of fish instead. The four of them stared at me, waiting for my response. There wasn't much I could say, really. I'd just be happy to finally leave this place. I held up my goblet to make a toast. To the Count, I said, hoping to gain his forgiveness. Two legs good, two wings better. I was a small child, about eight years old, when we went to visit Pilsenburg Prison. So you would think my recollections of that day would be hazy. But they are burnt into my memory permanently, like a scar on my mind that will never heal. The old penitentiary was a well-known tourist trap I would find out later in life. I did a lot of research after what happened. I'm sure you would, too. It turned out a few other people had 
paranormal experiences there, although no one else ever went missing. I found a few web pages dedicated to the old prison describing it as haunted. The giant fortress-like building was made of gray stone, mined from a nearby quarry over 150 years prior. My family had distant relatives visiting from Europe, and we had run out of standard touristy crap to do, so we had gone a bit off the beaten path and chosen to visit one of the oldest penitentiaries in the country, which was only a couple hours away. My dad's cousin stayed at home, saying he was too tired and to go without him, but his son Gunter decided he would come along. Gunter was a year older than I was at the time, and a precocious little brat. He would ask pointed questions in his perfect English, not a trace of German accent to be found, and then would have the nerve to second-guess you and correct you when you gave him the right answer. He was a mouthy little know-it-all, and I was looking forward to having him out of my bedroom. He had taken over my bed, and I'd been forced to sleep on the hard wooden floor, a victim of my parents' politeness. The tour started outside in the courtyard where the prisoners had exercised. The guide pointed out features here and there as a dozen of us unlucky souls trailed lackadaisically behind him. The giant building loomed over us dark and foreboding, blocking out the sun and leaving us chilly in the morning air. I didn't want to go inside, I had already realized that, but my parents were walking towards the entrance, leaving me behind. Gunter was up front with the tour guide, prodding him with repeated questions and correcting him when he made any minor error, pointing at the brochure in his hands. I hurried and followed them inside, trying to ignore the feelings of dread, as the dark entryway swallowed me up like the gaping maw of a grey stone giant. When we got inside, through several sets of steel bar cages, the guide explained these were screening points for new prisoners. His descriptions were vivid and I felt like I could see and hear the images he described of terrified prisoners being heckled by the guards and other inmates as they were marched in, shivering naked as they were born, hosed down and cavity searched. My mom covered my ears with this little detail and I swatted her hands away. As we continued along, I heard the tour guide make a snappier remark at Gunter. Why don't you leave the tour, you little smartass? Or something along those lines. He walked back to us again, looking momentarily dejected. Then he quickly remembered he could annoy me as well and perked up again. Did you know that prisoners here had to work on chain gangs? Do you know what chain gangs are, Jason? He pointed at the brochure and poked me in the ribs. I said, of course I know what chain gangs are. Regardless, he spent the next ten minutes explaining what they were to me, speaking loudly over the frustrated objections of the tour guide. We continued on into an old cell block. The guide explained how the prisoners would line up for inspection in their shoes, expected to be polished to a mere shine. He explained how new prisoners would be hazed, their shoes scuffed while they slept by their bunkmate, so they would fail the morning inspection. No excuses would be tolerated and they would be confined to the cell for the remainder of the day. It was no wonder cellmate murders and suicides reached record levels here. We went down some stairs and into the lower levels where we were told the cafeteria was located. I had an image of food and my stomach rumbled. I licked my lips and realized my throat was dry as well. A drink would be nice, I thought. But the guide went on to explain how no food or beverages were served on the premises any longer. That this was simply an old cafeteria used by prisoners. I grumbled something to my dad about how hungry I was, and he said we would get something to eat in an hour or two after we left the prison. Gunter stopped me for a moment. He grabbed my wrist and pulled me back away from the group. He said he had brought a few snacks along. I was suddenly warming up to my distant relative. He pulled out some German gummy bears and poured a few into my hands. 
We chewed them and looked around at our surroundings. The tour guide's voice got quieter and quieter as we were left behind. I wasn't worried at the time, thinking we would just run and catch up to them in a minute. Gunter started prattling on about something again, and I started getting anxious. He wouldn't shut up and ignored my body language, saying I wanted to move along. Finally, he finished, and I dragged him down the hallway. He seemed to take pleasure in my annoyance, and I began to dislike him again immediately. He dragged his feet as I pulled him along, and he began stopping and pointing out mundane things to purposely bother me further. I furrowed my brow, thinking it was odd I could no longer hear the group up ahead. We turned the corner, and I was surprised to note the sense of coffee and porridge wafting through the air. Odd, I thought, since the tour guide had said they no longer served food here. I heard voices from a doorway to the right up ahead. It sounded like a crowd of hundreds of people. Their voices, a low-pitched buzz. We walked up to the doorway and I stopped immediately. Gunter bumped into me and spilled a few of his gummy bears. He punched me in the arm, but I didn't even feel it. He turned and looked and dropped the whole bag of candy on the floor spilling the colorful little laxative bear bodies everywhere. Both of us stood in the doorway in complete shock. The room ahead of us was full of hundreds of prisoners. Their black and white striped uniforms were all identical. Their heads were shaved and their bodies packed shoulder to shoulder at the long tables where they sat eating gummy looking porridge and drinking black coffee. To one side of the room, a long line of prisoners were lined up, shuffling trays along a serving line and getting spoonfuls of slop ladled into their bowls by unsympathetic men dressed in white. Gunter began to walk through the doorway as if in a daze. I got a bad feeling watching him. It was as if I could sense that his walking through that threshold was a crossing over, and I knew that he should not cross over. I chased after him, grabbing his wrist. He was bigger than me, though. He looked back at me with a mischievous grin and pulled me through the doorway, laughing. It felt immediately different on the other side of the doorway. The voices of the prisoners rose up to a deafening roar, and the smells became immediate and real. I could now detect the burnt undertones of the coffee and the sweet and sour body odor of the many prisoners who stood all around us. I looked up and saw a big man with broad shoulders and a crooked smile. His bald head gleamed and I saw he was missing several teeth. He looked like a very bad man. He grabbed me by the bicep and his fingers dug in painfully. I tried to call out but he covered my mouth looking around quickly. He pulled me out of the big room with little effort, my feet dragging over the stone cobbled floor. I look over and saw Gunter had been grabbed by a couple of other prisoners who held him tight and covered his mouth. He was afraid and trying to scream. They dragged us through another doorway and into a cell block. No one was around and it seemed like everyone was preoccupied with breakfast in the big cafeteria. There were four of them, and they pulled us into a cell with hungry looks in their eyes. The man with the missing teeth pulled out a crudely made shank and held it up to Gunter's neck. He was struggling the hardest since he was bigger, and they decided to deal with him first. What the hell are we doing, Charlie? One prisoner said to the man with the missing teeth. He's a kid. How did he even get in here? Charlie backhanded the other man and sent him reeling. He staggered back and turned his face against the wall, rubbing his reddened cheek. Johnny ain't keen enough to see him up there. I don't know what to tell you, gents. The man with the missing teeth said, digging the blade in deeper. But I can't tell you exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna use these lads as bargaining chips. We can be our ticket out of here. The other two men looked at him dubiously. They bickered back and forth a bit, but reluctantly agreed to give it a shot. They were all sentenced to life, so they saw no downside from what I could overhear. 
The man with the missing teeth became a bit distracted by the conversation as his blade drifted further and further from Gunter's neck. His hand crept closer to his mouth inadvertently. Suddenly, Gunter twisted his head and bit down hard on Charlie's hand. He screamed in pain and dropped the knife. Gunter thrashed and wriggled his head, his mouth filling with blood as his teeth dug it deeper and deeper into the man's hand. The other three men grabbed my distant cousin and held him down as he kicked and wailed. They covered his mouth and made a hasty gag out of a pillowcase. I saw Charlie nursing his wounds and made the mistake of looking him in the eyes. He caught me looking and his stare burnt into me like the sun. He's going to teach us a lesson, he said. Gunter was crying as he was held down and restrained painfully. They forced him to watch as Charlie picked up the dirty shank from the floor and walked over to me. He told me this is how it works here. If one man's shoes are scuffed, the bunkmate has to spend the whole day in the cell with him too. It's a mutual punishment, but worth it to show a new prisoner his place. They were going to show us our place, he said. He took the dirty shank and I watched, horrified, as they held out my hand and extended my fingers. The missing tooth man went to saw away with the blunt and filthy blade, making slow progress as he hacked off my pinky finger. It was slow work with the crude instrument. He finally reached bone and it took another few minutes to get through that. I passed out from the pain at least once, but probably more. When that finger was fully removed, he moved over to the other side and did the same thing there. The blade became blunter as he worked, and I screamed and screamed through the hands which muffled my voice. The man behind me twisted my neck painfully with every sound I made and choked me with his forearm around my neck. With both my smallest fingers removed, the man walked over to Gunter next. He waved the fingers in his face, and the blood flew and splattered on him. Hey, look at what you did. It's be your fault, you little swine. In fact, yourself, the man said, and threw the severed fingers at Gunter's face. He took the blunt blade and plunged it into Gunter's belly. Blood spurred into the air and all over the stone floor as he removed the blade and reinserted it several more times, slowly and methodically. His friends began to look around anxiously, and I wondered how much more time was left before prisoners and guards began to return from the meal. Gunter collapsed to the floor with a loud thud, his head crashing against the steel bars of the cage door. The men kneeled over him for a second, making sure he was still alive, and I sensed my chance. It would probably be my last opportunity to escape, so I went for it. I curled my bloody hands into eight-fingered fists and punched Charlie square in the biscuits. He went down to his knees and clutched himself, cursing me and screaming. By the time the other men had turned around, though, I was already running past them. My small size worked to my advantage, and I managed to duck past their reaching hands as they tried to grab me. I sprinted from the cell back down towards the cafeteria, blood pouring from the places where my fingers used to be. I got back to the cafeteria and saw prisoners were beginning to file out. Several of them saw me and gave surprised looks, pointing and exclaiming. The old slang they used sounded a hundred years old, and I didn't understand half of what they were saying. I ran past the crowd and managed to get back to the open door of the portal we had come through that had somehow transported us back a century or more. It shimmered and looked glassy and surreal. I tried to step through and stop, not of my own volition. The hand that grabbed me belonged to a guard, I saw. His blue uniform was neatly pressed, the brass buttons on his vest gleaming, and his grip was iron on my arm. How the trolley that, laddie? Are you stealing for the scullery? Is that it? I can't let you see so quick. He began to pull me away from the door, my feet dragged on the stone floor as I wailed and hollered. Ah, we'll never count how I managed to get in there, Bon. They your parents, yeah? When? Are you an orphan in Egypt? He looked down at my hands and finally noticed my fingers. Bugger, that's a fan injury. Wait, happened till your fingers were in. 
I tried to tell him I just needed to go through the doorway, just take me back to the doorway, but he wouldn't listen. Panicking, I kicked him in the shin. But his grip stayed firm and his eyes went cold. You wee bass, I will murder you for that! He said and pulled out a club from the holster at his waist. He swung it at me and hit me in the knee. I felt it shatter and collapse to the ground instantly. I looked up at him and saw he was saying something about how I deserved it. And that was when Charlie came up behind him. He took the dull knife and made a quick red line appear across the guard's throat. The man dropped his club and clutched his neck, blood pouring out from the gaps between his fingers. I tried to crawl away but looked back and saw the gap-toothed man standing over me. His broad face was red and full of fury. He plunged the shank down into my leg. Pain flared up all anew and my adrenaline kicked into overdrive. My pituitary gland tried desperately to drown out the pain with endorphins, but was only partially successful. Several prisoners grabbed Charlie from behind, suddenly cursing at him, saying that no one should hurt a kid. I couldn't believe that they were going to save me. I crawled away from them, dragging my shattered knee and my other leg with a stab wound as well. My unfortunate finger stumps left pools of blood on the gray stone as I pulled myself towards the shimmering doorway ahead. I finally reached it and pulled myself through to the other side. It was a while before anyone found me, and they never found Gunter. I tried to tell them what happened, but no one believed me. The story is pretty far-fetched, I know. Time traveling is generally considered by most people to be impossible. But I guess I'm no longer most people. Everyone told me I was lying and needed to start being truthful. To this day, most of my family will no longer talk to me except for my parents. But this is the truth. I mean, why would I shatter my own kneecap, cut off both my pinky fingers, and plunge a blunt homemade knife into my own leg? Unless I was completely bonkers, I would never do that. Am I completely bonkers? Maybe Gunter's still alive somewhere back in the 19th century. I don't know what to think or what to hope. If he is still back there, maybe we really screwed things up. Time, space, continuum, and all that jazz. I'm a little worried about that, too. What if we screwed everything up by going back in time? What if we broke the universe? There's a vase in the corner of my living room. I, I just filled it with water, but... I don't know why I bothered. Are sunflowers supposed to float? St. Daniel's Mental Hospital was haunted. Everybody in town knew that. Especially Century Manor, the old house at the back of the property, which had stood there for 150 years, longer than any other building on the grounds. Maybe that's why it was such a popular place for kids to go urban exploring. We all wanted to prove that we could brave going in there. Not just to ourselves, to each other. That's why Teddy and I went in there, I guess. It was partly just boredom. The product of a late August day with the end of summer vacation looming ahead in the next two weeks. There was a feeling between the two of us left unspoken, that we had wasted the summer. Everyone else in class would be talking about trips to Europe and cruises to the Caribbean, while Teddy and I would be left without a story to tell between the two of us. My parents were supposed to take me to the beach one week in July, but it had been thunder showering, so we'd stayed home. Our camping trip had likewise been cancelled due to a family illness. Teddy's family had even fewer planned summer events. 
but they had likewise been plagued by misfortune and last-minute cancellations. His parents' motto seemed to be the same as mine. We'll make it up to you next summer. But that left us feeling antsy and annoyed as we meandered around the perimeter of the mental hospital grounds, the place we were not supposed to venture into. Our families lived in the neighborhood across the street from the century-and-a-half-old asylum, so we knew about the lore of the facility better than anyone. But our parents were much more concerned by the tangible threats posed by patients who wandered the hospital grounds, largely unsupervised. I know what we should do today, Teddy said suddenly. Let's go explore Century Manor. I heard there's a way to get inside. Part of me wanted to say no, to make up some excuse. But another part was desperate for adventure, and a tale to tell in September. Everyone else in class would have a vacation story. But we would have a ghost story. All right, let's do it. I agreed, following him as he stepped foot onto the forbidden grounds of the asylum. I hurried after him, and we stayed close to the tree line, hoping to avoid detection. When we got to Century Manor, I looked up to see the old building's windows staring down at us like sleepy eyes. Its dark, ancient exterior was falling apart in places, the trim moldy and rotting. Tiles from the roof had slipped off and lay in the grass, turning it brown beneath their weight. So how are we supposed to get in? I asked, looking at the steel bars on all of the windows. How about the front door? Teddy said, smiling, walking towards the entrance. I couldn't believe it. The old wooden door should have been tightly locked, but instead it was hanging open and swaying gently in the breeze. Hmm. Weird. Pretty sure that's supposed to be locked, I said, following Teddy towards the entrance. It was dark inside, almost impossible to see past the first few feet. My friend took a few tentative steps into the house before being swallowed up by shadows. Hey, wait up, I called after him, but there was no indication that he'd heard me. Looking down, I saw a loose brick lying on the porch of the old house. I picked it up and used it as a doorstop, hoping it would prevent anyone from closing the door and sealing us inside. Suddenly I was beginning to realize that that was a real possibility. Teddy, I'm not sure about this, I said, stepping into the dark house. It took my eyes a few seconds to adjust. I blinked and looked around to see the old house was dingy and falling apart inside. Even worse than the exterior. The ceiling to my right was bulging, looked ready to cave in at any second. The floors creaked noisily with each step I took as if ready to break. Let's go upstairs, Teddy said, seeming bored already with the main level. Despite his eager attitude, I felt like there was something immediately wrong with this place. It felt like a weight on my soul crushing my heart, making it difficult to breathe. Don't you feel that? I asked. Feel what? But before I could answer, Teddy was already climbing the stairs, going up to the second level. The stairs squeaked and strained with each step he took. I saw a mouse scurrying up ahead on the main level. I hurried to catch up with him, taking a nervous glance back over my shoulder at the front door, which was still hanging open. Like the door to a trap. 
about to snap shut. The two of us climbed the stairs and explored the second floor. But of course, Teddy wanted to keep going. There was a third floor in the old manor, and he wanted to see that too. So far, there was nothing to explain the uneasy feeling I was getting. But the sensation was growing stronger the closer we got to that third level. I don't like this, I told Teddy as we came to an old gray wooden door covered in graffiti, including a few pentagrams. Let's go back, okay? This doesn't feel right. He looked at me like I was being a scared little kid, ruining his adventure. Which, I guess I was. I felt a little bad about it, but I couldn't ignore the feeling I was getting. It was becoming completely overwhelming. Okay, you big baby. This is the last room, then we'll leave. He said, pushing the door open as I told him again to stop. I had a very strong suspicion that whatever was giving me these negative feelings was just beyond that door. And when it opened, I saw I was not wrong. The scene playing out on the third floor was like something from a horror movie, except this was real life. A girl who was dressed in century-old clothing stood before a small fire, which was burning at the center of the room. She was giggling as the pile of kindling she had lit grew brighter, and the fire burned hotter. I heard her chanting some dark incantation beneath her breath, and her eyes rolled back. Suddenly her voice was no longer that of a child, but of something else much deeper, much more evil. What the hell? Teddy yelled, snapping me out of my terror momentarily. At least he could see it too. If not for that, I wasn't sure what I would do. Would you let go of my arm, man? What is your problem? That was when I realized... He couldn't see any of it after all. The little girl in the fire was all invisible to him. I'd heard this place was haunted, but not everyone was capable of seeing the phantoms who resided here. Just as I had thought that, Teddy pulled his arm out of my vice-like grip and began to march into the room. You're so weird, dude. There's nothing here. I was frozen in place, unable to scream, as he walked straight towards the fire burning in the center of the room. The little girl was now levitating a few inches off the ground, her eyes still white and rolled back, but now she had a grin spreading wide across her face. She began to laugh as Teddy strode into the fire. It took him a few seconds to realize what was happening, like someone who has set their hand on a stove burner, only to realize it has turned on. But then, in an instant, he was lit up like a torch. Teddy turned into a blazing inferno, as the little girl's laugh turned into a screeching cackle. I felt something cold rush through me a second later and then saw two women in white and black habits like those worn by nuns. They were putting out the fire and praying, holding a Bible up into the air and pulling the little girl back down to the floor. She settled gently to the ground as the fire went out, and I realized Teddy had also been extinguished, as if the fire existed in some other time, and I was the only one who could see it. And then, running out of that room, I raced down the stairs to find a security guard at the door, pulling the brick doorstop from its place. Who the hell keeps opening this door? He was saying to himself. I yelled at him to stop and told him to get help. My friend was in trouble. Not again, 
the security guard muttered, probably thinking I couldn't hear him. They really need to tear this whole place down before it kills anyone else. Luckily, Teddy survived the event, but he's been in a coma for quite a while and was unable to defend me during the court proceedings. I was forced to tell the judge what had happened by myself, and he wasn't inclined to believe me. Pyromaniac ghosts aren't exactly the best legal defense, as my exasperated lawyer will tell you. But I wasn't going to lie, and I wasn't going to admit to something I didn't do. I didn't hurt my friend. I didn't leave him there to die. (sighs) Just hope Teddy wakes up one day soon. I know he'll tell them I'm innocent. I just hope my best friend can clear my name. Or I'm going to be in this asylum for a long, long time. Okay. You know what? I'm going to get sued over this, and right now I really don't care anymore. The shit I've seen by now is so fucked up. Most of you people aren't even going to believe me. But this needs to get out. No matter what the cost. I work, or worked, for a very big research company. And no, I'm not a scientist. I'm a security guard. Honestly, I'm barely above minimum wage, and I had to sign a fuckload of NDAs. Even though, for the most part, I have no idea what's going on at the company I work for. I only knew that they were into pharmaceuticals. Researching new drugs, cures, and all that. And hey, that's pretty neat. They were trying to save the world. A lot of respect for that. My job was to guard the door. Anyone comes in? eh, They need to have a valid badge that gets cleared by me. I've never had a problem with it, and very few people have ever given me any trouble. In hindsight, the first inkling I got over what was going on was when I overheard a few of the eggheads chattering as they left the lab for lunch one afternoon. I caught a few snippets of conversation like returning cognitive function and reversible brain death, which all sounded pretty cool. I mean, I read somewhere that someone else returned some brain function to a dead pig. And I got to wondering if these folks were doing something similar. I mean, that would be pretty cool, right? I got to think about the wonders of modern science and dazzle at what the future held for medical advancements for a little bit, provided a bunch of middle-aged suburban moms didn't get in the way. That was a good feeling. I didn't hear much about whatever project they were working on after that. I mean, that's fine. The eggheads were supposed to keep work at work and not let it out. Can't have the competition hearing about it or have things leaking. I mostly forgot about that snippet of a conversation I'd heard, and went back to spending my days checking badges and scrolling social media when I wasn't busy. Then came Brian. Brian Mendelson and I had never talked much. He was a mid-tier level employee who had a weekday shift that ended at 7. He was portly, balding, and kind of resembled the sick love child between Matthew Broderick and Danny DeVito. He'd been working at the lab as long as I'd been there, so I didn't think much of him. He was just another passing face that I never spoke to. He sure as hell never acted suspicious. When he left one night, a little early, with a stiffer posture than I remembered and a briefcase I didn't remember seeing him with before, I didn't think too much of it. I noticed. That was my job, after all. But I didn't say anything to him. He looked at me expectantly as he got halfway to the parking lot, and I awkwardly waved at him. Brian awkwardly waved back, before he got into his car and drove off. 
The next morning, I got called into the office to get screamed at by my boss. Someone had stolen some samples from one of the labs. There was no evidence of a break-in, so the conclusion was that it had to be one of the people with clearance. A good old-fashioned case of industrial espionage. Well, there was only one guy I could think of who'd been acting suspicious, and that was Brian. I told him that, too. I don't know the details of what happened next. I know that they looked into him, but they didn't find anything. I wasn't fired, since there was no way to prove the theft happened on my watch, or that the thief had been easily visible. I was, however, told to inspect all bags upon exit to ensure that no one was smuggling anything out. I targeted Brian at first, of course. He'd been the obvious suspect, so naturally I wanted to make sure he wasn't pulling some kind of con, stealing samples and selling them for a bit of side money. Over the next week, though, nothing happened. No one tried anything, and I went back to my usual life. I watched the news on my phone in between browsing Reddit, and I remembered there'd been some controversy over a local funeral home misplacing the body of a college student who'd hung herself. Damn shame. She'd been a beauty, too, a cute girl by the name of Taylor Jones. Probably a little too young for me, but still cute. Always a shame when a cute girl dies. Brian avoided eye contact as I checked his bag a few nights later. He seemed distracted, and kept looking at his phone. He'd emptied out his pockets for me as instructed, but I didn't really find anything out of the ordinary, and he didn't speak either. All right, you have a nice night, I said, nodding at him. He nodded back and left abruptly. Sure enough, the next morning there was another break-in. A vial of something had been stolen, and I had proof that I'd checked everyone's bags. The security camera footage showed me doing it, so I was as pissed off as the head honchos were, and there wasn't jack shit they could do about it. I was doing my job, and they knew it. Even if I wasn't in trouble, though, I was a little concerned about how someone had managed to sneak past me. I mean, sure, there are ways to do it. Brian could have taped the vial to his body under his clothes. He could have put it in his mouth or up his ass. Like I said, I do recall him not speaking at all to me, and I chalked it up to just plain rudeness. I say Brian because I had a sneaking suspicion that it was him behind all of this. Just a feeling in my gut. I couldn't prove it, but he seemed so much shiftier lately. This set up a whole string of debates about just how far they could search their employees to see if they were hiding something. Did we really need to go as far as to do a cavity search on our own employees? Was that actually necessary? I got to thinking about it, and I really didn't want it to go that far. Plus, the more I stewed on it, the more pissed off I got. Here I was working my ass off for barely minimum wage, and some asshole already making more than I would ever make was stealing their own work to sell and make even more money. Now that pissed me off, and it's what got me really thinking. What was Brian even up to, assuming it was him? He hadn't stopped acting suspicious. He always seemed to leave early, and hurried to his car after work. He couldn't have acted more guilty if he tried. I got it into my mind to do a little investigation. I took a night off, and when quitting time came, I waited in my car down the street for Brian to leave work. Sure enough, a minute or so out before seven, Brian's car pulled out of the lot and he started driving. I followed at enough of a distance so he wouldn't get suspicious. I didn't want to spook him. Brian drove until he was well out of town, and I started to wonder if I was just following him home. I mean, this was a gross invasion of privacy, and I was starting to have doubts. He eventually got off the highway and pulled into a motel, a good hour away from where we worked. Jesus, did he live here? I parked on the street and watched from a distance as he got out of his car and went to talk to the motel clerk. Through the window, I saw the clerk give him a key and smile at him. 
It didn't look like Brian paid anything. Brian walked out of the office and to a nearby motel door, where he went inside and closed it behind him. Had had I just watched this guy go to a booty call? I left and stewed on it for a day or so. Brian's behavior hadn't really changed at all over the next few days. On my next day off, I followed him to the motel again. This time, after he was in his room, I opted to go into the office and have a chat with the clerk. The guy behind the desk was a weaselly-looking bastard with a toque who stank of cigarette smoke. We're full up, he said gruffly. Nothing at all, huh? I said we're full. Sorry, you're gonna have to go elsewhere. He didn't stand up, he just watched me, waiting for me to leave, and I didn't really try to engage this guy in any further conversation. I didn't leave just yet, though. I walked past the rooms, listening closely. There wasn't much sound at all. It was quiet. No voices, no TV, nothing. I stopped by one of the darkened motel room windows and peered inside cautiously. This looked empty, even though the clerk had said they were full. Come to think of it, I hadn't seen any cars outside, save for Brian's and two others. The motel looked like it had way more capacity than that. Then I saw movement in the bedroom. Clearly someone was walking around in there. I had an idea and I knocked on the door. Housekeeping? I said it in my best customer service voice. No response. Frowning, I tried the door. Locked. I tried something else. Now, I know that my job is technically security, but I didn't have the best upbringing. I may or may not have been a wild child, and doing that taught me a number of things, including how to pick a lock. The door came open easily once I'd picked it, and when I looked inside, I could see the figure of a person standing in the darkness. Oh, shit, sorry, I didn't know anyone was in here, I said. Still no sound. Hello? I reached for the light switch and turned it on. The woman standing in the room was blonde, beautiful and naked as the day she was born. She stared at me with a vacant expression and I slowly drew closer to her. Oh shit, ma'am, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were... She just stood there, not trying to hide herself. It was like there was no one even home. She just fucking stood there. Ma'am? I took a step closer, and as I studied her face, I realized I knew her from somewhere. Looking closer, the bruises on her neck helped it all click into place. This was the girl I'd seen on the news. The one who'd hung herself. The one whose body had gone missing. Taylor Jones. For the longest time, I just stared. I mean, what the hell was I going to do? I tried to reason away what I was seeing. I mean, there's got to be tons of cute blonde chicks around, right? Especially ones with ligature marks who stand naked in motel rooms in the dark and don't move. I had to get her out of there. I mean, she was clearly drugged up or something, right? I took her by the hand and she went along with me with absolutely no resistance. I caught a glimpse of the bed and saw an open box of condoms on the table beside her. I turned my stomach to imagine what they were doing there. I just made it through the door when someone clotheslined me with a baseball bat. I hit the ground hard and without anything even remotely resembling dignity. My ears were ringing and I saw stars. Now, 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 you're going to pay for that. I recognized the hostile drawl of the motel clerk as I writhed on the ground. I saw him gently push Taylor back into the room before he stepped in as well. He grabbed me by the back of the shirt and dragged me into the room with him. Now this is an unfortunate predicament we're in, the clerk said. He guided Taylor towards a nearby chair and made her sit. What the hell did you do to her? I murmured as the clerk sat down on the bed. Due to her, not a damn thing. If anything, she did it to herself. 
You faked her death and brought her here, I replied. I saw her on the news. Faked it? The clerk scoffed. I think you've got it all wrong. I got to my knees and looked over at Taylor in her chair. She didn't move, didn't react to us at all. The door opened and I saw Brian coming in. His shirt was untucked and the concern on his face grew when he saw me. What the hell? You know him? The clerk asked, pointing the baseball bat at me. Yeah, he's the security guy at the lab. Brian frowned. Jeb, how did he get in here? Caught him poking around this room. The clerk, Jeb, replied. Looks like he found our hanging girl here. Jesus. I knew you shouldn't have gotten her. She was too high profile. Brian swore under his breath, never once taking his eyes off of me. Hey, you didn't have any complaints when you were plugging her a couple days ago. Jeb snapped. This whole operation was your idea, so don't dare shift the blame onto me. Well, you're the one choosing the girls, Brian replied, his temper rising. He stopped and rubbed his temples. We need to handle this, he said, and Jeb nodded, looking over at me too. What the hell are you guys doing here? What the hell did you do to that girl? We didn't do anything, Brian said. I mean, we didn't kill her, at least. She was already dead. The look on my face made it clear that I had no idea what he was talking about, so Brian elaborated. I assume you came because you were looking for the missing vials. Or at least you were wondering if I was selling them or something, right? I didn't answer, and he didn't bother waiting for me to. I don't suppose you know what was in those vials, do you? You probably don't even know what we do in that lab. Nothing as fucked up as this, I replied. Brian grimaced. We developed a mixture of chemicals that can stimulate a dead brain. Restart a body, as it were. In effect, we can bring people back to life by simply giving them a needle right behind the eye. They're a little weary about doing human trials of the lab just yet. So I asked Jeb here if he'd let me experiment. I needed to see if it worked. Why? So you could fuck him? I asked. Brian pursed his lips. That wasn't the original plan, he admitted. The subjects regain low-level cognitive functions, but they lose just about all higher brain functions. They're alive, but they're basically vegetables. I didn't really have much to do with my first few subjects, and Jeb's business mostly consists of prostitutes, so we made a little arrangement. Provided some in-house services, as it were. I provided him bodies, and he split the income with me. I stared at him in horror. You've been pimping out dead girls? Why the hell not? Jeb asked. Hop, he's ass that won't say no. Doesn't need a cut. Never had so much business. The serum works, Brian insisted. Even if we did get a little sidetracked. You're insane. You're both fucking insane. It was the only thing I could think to say, and Brian just sighed. And you're the result of my carelessness. He looked over at Jeb. Don't make too much of a mess. I'm sure we can frame it as a car accident or something. Jeb just smiled and nodded before raising the baseball bat. I wondered if he was expecting me to die easily, but I had no intention of going out like that. He hit me again with the bat and I went down. All part of the plan. I kicked him in the knee as hard as I could and I heard it crack. Jeb went down and I saw the bat slip out of his hands. God damn it! Brian went for the bat. So did I. He made it there first since he was walking and I was crawling. He raised it above his head as I hurried towards him, getting on my feet again. 
I tackled him right before he could hit me, slamming him into the wall of the motel. I tried to rip the bat from his grip. Jeb was on his feet again, and he grabbed me from behind, struggling to pull me off of Brian. The bat weakly bopped against my head, and I slammed my head backwards to hit Jeb in the face. I could feel his nose crunch. I resumed my attack on Brian, punching him in the face over and over again. I felt his glasses break beneath my fist, and Jeb tried again to pull me off. This time he succeeded, but not before I ripped the bat away from Brian. Jeb pushed me away, and his eyes widened when I saw he had the bat. I swung it at his face as hard as I could. He went down, and I kept swinging until I was sure he wasn't ever going to get back up. His corpse twitched on the floor, and I could see Brian watching from the corner of my eye. Jesus Christ. He blindly scrambled towards the door, hoping to escape, but I was faster. I seized him by the coat and threw him to the ground. No, wait, don't. I didn't care. I raised the bat and didn't stop hitting him until his head was nothing but a thick red paste. Covered in blood and exhausted, I sat down on the bed, panting heavily and finally looking at Taylor. She'd sat there throughout the violence, never once moving. She didn't even react to the corpses, and honestly, that was fine. I stared at her sadly, and after resting, I decided I had to look at the other rooms. There were 17 girls in that motel, including Taylor. I didn't recognize all of them, but I was pretty sure they didn't all die by suicide. Seventeen girls Brian had brought back to life, just so Jeb could run his little brothel. God, it made me sick. How many had he murdered? It was the question at the forefront of my mind. All of them? Most of them? The only one who would give me the answer was dead. And there was no way to bring him back, even with the serum. There wasn't a brain left to revive. Not that I would have, even if I'd wanted to. I burned the motel to the ground. And I made sure all the girls were right there in the middle of the fire when I did it. Better that they just die again than whatever else would have happened to them. If I had called the lab and told them what had happened... I don't know for sure that they'd let those girls just stay dead. After Brian, I didn't want to risk trusting them again. I'm signing off now, and then I'm probably going to get sued, but I really don't care. Whatever those people in the lab are working on, it's not worth it. No matter what they do with it. There will always be more Brian's and Jeb's to exploit it. And I'll be damned if I'm ever going to let that happen again. The new girl in class smiled at me as she sat down at the desk across the aisle. Her grin was a little crooked, revealing dark, red-stained teeth. As if she'd just been drinking fruit punch. I'll admit she seemed a bit weird right from the start. She wandered in halfway through the semester, causing the teachers in my high school a lot of grief. During every lesson, she was confused, as if whatever school she'd been to previously was not up to snuff. Regardless of that, Hilda attended every day and sat right beside me. We shared glances back and forth across the aisle, and I got the impression she liked me. Then, one day, she passed me a note, asking what I thought of her. Being a 16-year-old boy with few romantic prospects, I passed it back with a picture of a cartoon wolf howling at the moon, and she burst out laughing. After that, we were inseparable. She started coming over to my house after school, and I introduced her to my parents. We went to the movies together and watched TV in my basement. We made out on the couch in the darkness of my den, listening carefully for my mom's creeping footsteps coming down the stairs. We dated for a few weeks before I began getting a little freaked out by some of her quirks. 
She hit it pretty well at first. But after a while, things started to add up. It wasn't any one big problem. Just lots of little things. She collected my hair. That was weird. She gathered up bunches of it for my brush, and I caught her stuffing it into her pockets one day. When I confronted her about it, she just denied it. The other strange thing was that I was never allowed to go over to her house. She said her parents were very religious and would never let her have a guy over. But when I dropped her off at night, I would see strange flashes of red and green light glowing through the windows from inside. And once I could have sworn I saw someone levitating, hovering several feet off the floor, and screaming at the top of their lungs, looking terrified. But when I looked back, the person was gone, as if I had just imagined it. Oh, and she wore strange jewelry as well. Upside-down crosses and pentagrams. Weird, druidic symbols that were made into necklaces and rings. I asked her once if she was into Wicca, but she just looked confused and told me she preferred comfortable furniture. It wasn't just those things that made me break up with her. My friend Greg told me this other girl, Sarah, had a little thing for me. And I always thought she was pretty hot. In retrospect, I probably should have been nicer about it. I should have called Hilda at least to break up with her. But instead, I just sent her a text saying it was over. She called me two seconds later, bursting into tears when I confirmed it was real. She asked what she'd done wrong, and I told her it wasn't her, it was me. But she didn't sound any happier about things, and just kept asking me why I was really breaking up with her. I started to get impatient, and we ended up bickering back and forth for a while. After 30 minutes of arguing, I told her what I really thought of her, and the actual reasons why I was breaking up with her. Big mistake. The crying stopped suddenly, and I heard the sound of a dial tone. A little while after we hung up, I felt a stabbing pain in my belly as if someone were driving a knife into my abdomen. It got worse and worse until I doubled over, and I was soon laying on the floor of my living room, howling in agony. It let up after a few long minutes, and I groaned with relief, getting up from the floor on wobbly legs. I got a text from Hilda a moment later, the message included a picture displaying a strange-looking homemade doll with wispy strands of human hair protruding from its head. The face on it looked like my face, and there was a needle being driven into the doll's belly, deforming the soft fabric with its sharp needle point. Another text came through from Hilda. Sore tummy? she asked mockingly. I began to type in a message with shaking hands, begging for her forgiveness and telling her I didn't mean what I said, I just needed some time alone. Bullshit, she responded. I know you're leaving me for Sarah. Before I could type anything back, I felt a searing pain in my belly again, but this time much worse than before. I looked down to see blood pouring out and dripping to the floor, 
forming a puddle around my feet. Another text came through, and this one was a picture again. It was her cutting the doll's plump belly open with a serrated knife, pulling back the fabric to reach inside. The phone dinged again with another message and another picture. I had imagined there being white fuzz inside this strange little figurine, like any other stuffed doll would have inside. But instead there was blood, with bits that looked like tiny organs floating in it. I felt as if a hand were reaching inside of me, pulling on things, twisting my guts, cutting and hacking with a knife. And surely enough, the next picture she sent showed her clutching a chicken liver, or a kidney in her hand. And another showed her squeezing it into a juicy, chunky pulp. On my left side, it felt as if something had just burst. And I screamed as the warmth of blood filled my insides. My guts felt like they were being twisted and pulled for a few long moments. But then that sensation stopped. And I was left gasping for breath again down on my knees, although I didn't remember how I'd gotten there. I sent Hilda a text with my trembling hands, missing the buttons and taking five minutes to get it done. But finally I managed to finish the message and to send it. Please, take me back. I'm sorry. It was all I could think to do. It was the only way to get her to stop hurting me. I'm coming over, she replied a moment later. I'll see you soon. With a pit of dread forming in my stomach, I sent her a response saying that I couldn't wait to see her. I just hoped she could fix whatever she'd done to me, using the magic of her strange little doll. When she arrived at my door, a wave of relief washed over me, seeing that she had brought the doll with her. Maybe she did intend to fix me, I thought, and a hopeful grin spread at the corners of my mouth. Oh, thanks for coming over, I said. So? Will you take me back? Can you fix me? Hilda seemed to consider this for a moment. But then she shook her head. No, she said. Nobody can fix you. I just wanted to watch this part for myself. And with that, she produced a small pocket knife and began to cut long gashes down vertically across the doll's face running over the eyes and popping the tiny sewn buttons which were attached there. She dug the blade and twisted it, sending pieces of the doll flying through the air. Not so handsome anymore, she said, as blood began to pour from my cheeks and my eyeballs burst open, spilling intraocular fluids which ran warmly down my chin you know, I don't think Sarah is going to be interested in you after all. Okay, let's get one thing straight right off the bat. I'm a good person. I mean, I'm not a great person. I'm not like the Pope or Mother Frickin' Teresa. Nobody's going to canonize me after I'm gone. But I do my best. I say good morning to people at work. I bring in donuts occasionally. Last week I even offered to help an old lady clear some snow off her car. It's hard to think of more examples right now, but just take my word for it, I'm a decent person. Anyways, there's this guy on my drive home from work. 
He's not far from where I live, and I pass by him almost every day. In the winter, every so often I'll roll down my car window and pass a couple bucks out to him. At least, I meant to. I saw other people doing it all the time, so I figured he was okay. He, he was getting by, I thought, even if he did look pretty cold. Pretty desperate and disheveled. Wrap up in a blanket and shivering all the time. If I'd known the truth, I would have done more. I don't usually carry cash. Almost everything's debit these days. And if I do have a bit of coinage, I need to save it for the coin-operated washing machine I used to do my laundry. It's hard to find change these days, after all. Like I said, I, I meant to do more. I wanted to do more. But I didn't. Maybe that's why this is happening to me. Anyways, when I opened my back car door yesterday morning at 6 a.m. to throw my work bag inside, I recognized him right away. It had been a cold night, the temperature dropping to 30 below freezing. Even for Canada, that's cold. There he was in the backseat of my car, dead from exposure. His beard was coated in icicles and his skin was slightly blue in the dim light of the morning. He wasn't moving and he wasn't breathing. I shook him, trying to see if he would wake up, if maybe he was just sleeping. But he was definitely dead. After calling 911, the police and an ambulance came and took him away. I told the cops what I knew and they said it wasn't my fault. These things happen more often than people would believe. Lock up the car next time. Get an alarm system. And this won't happen. I muttered something in agreement, thinking him a bit heartless. Part of me didn't mind the guy using my car to sleep, especially if it was helping him stay alive in the cold weather. More than anything else, I felt bad I hadn't done more to help him. I felt an immense guilt like a hand gripping my heart, squeezing it tightly. The shorter cop walked away and the other one stayed behind and looked at me sympathetically. I don't mind him, he said. A guy's own wife hates his guts. He doesn't care about anybody but himself. It's too bad about this guy, though. I'm sure somebody out there will miss him. I'll try to find out who they are and I'll let them know what happened here. He doesn't have any ID, but maybe someone will recognize him or we can match his prints. Thanks for calling us. The cops started walking away and I went back to my car. I got in and began to drive towards my job at the hospital. It was light out by that point and I had to explain my tardiness to my manager. But when I told people what had happened, they quickly forgave me, and I got a lot of sympathetic looks. That made me feel even guiltier. I didn't deserve sympathy, I thought. Not after I had done nothing to help the man while he was still alive. When I drove home that evening, it was dark outside once again, and I heard something rustling around in the back seat. The car was moving along at a steady speed with traffic on all sides, so I couldn't exactly stop to look around. I thought it was just the sound of junk shifting around back there for a few moments since I had left my basketball in the car and it tended to roll around. But then a hand gripped my shoulder, icy cold and blue. It gripped my trapezius, pinching and twisting, caused me to jerk the steering wheel to the side and swerve in pain and fright. The driver in the car beside me honked, rolling down his window. He gave me the finger, cursing at me. I had other concerns, though. 
like the familiar blue-tinged face staring at me in the reflection of the rearview mirror. Holy shit. You're that dead homeless guy who died in my car. His emaciated face stared to look back at me in the mirror. His grin showed yellowed and missing teeth, and his skin was pulled taut over prominent cheekbones, making him look skeletal, terrifying. His blue-tinged skin reflecting even bluer in the flickering streetlight's glow. You know, person experiencing homelessness is actually the preferred term these days, he said. It's less stigmatizing. Nobody likes to be put in a box. <laughs> no pun intended. What do you want from me? I asked, almost screaming at him. My heart was pounding wildly and my hands were gripping the steering wheel tightly. The road seemed to blur in and out of focus in front of me. I'm not sure yet, he said, considering this. I'm just not ready to move on. It's like something's keeping me here. What's that? Hell if I know. Wish I could say. Maybe it's you. Me? What did I do? You just happened to die in my car. <laughs> right. So you're saying you didn't drive past me every day on that street corner and ignore me? I'd still be alive if I'd had a few bucks to buy a coffee at McDonald's, you know. That's what I used to do to warm up. But they don't let you sit inside unless you buy something. Sometimes I'd hop on a bus, sit in the back till they kicked me off. I relied on those situations and the kindness of strangers like you for spare change to get by. But no. Not strangers like you. Never people like you. I was silent for a few seconds. Then I said the worst thing possible. Uh, why didn't you just get a job? There's plenty of them out there. Excuse me? You're asking the dead guy why he isn't employed? Sorry, maybe that's a rude question. You're right, it is a rude question. Silence ensued for a few more long seconds. You think I didn't try? Nobody wants to hire a bum. Got no address, no phone number. Red flags for any employer. It reads, unstable. Oh, and I did have a job, just so you know. I was a bricklayer. My wife left me and I started drinking to cut the pain. She was the only good thing in my life, the only thing that kept me going. And when she left, it was, it was like I lost everything. And before I knew it, I really did lose everything. Couldn't get my shit together, and my boss fired me, and then I lost my house and the divorce. My kids stopped talking to me. You have a kid? Had a kid. I had a kid. Past tense, remember? Uh, what about the shelters? I asked, genuinely curious now. Why didn't you stay there to get out of the cold? Boy, you just know everything, don't you? Hell, I never heard of a homeless shelter before. What's that? I could tell he was being snide, so I didn't say anything. This was one sarcastic ghost. But at least he wasn't trying to kill me. Not yet, anyways. You know, the thing about the shelters is you're only allowed to sleep there. And even then, only for so long. The limit at the one in town here is three months. And they're always over capacity nowadays, so there's no exceptions like there used to be. I went over my three months, they kicked me out. To make space for the next guy. 
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought the system was better than that and more forgiving and kinder. Man, I'm sorry. If I'd known, you would have flipped me a quarter now and then. A long silence sat between us. There was no sound in the car except for the hum of the tires and the other traffic going past outside. Look, I want to try to make it up to you. How, how can I do that? I asked. The cops said they'd try to find your family, so... Who's your son? I'll, I'll find him. I'll give him a message for you, whatever you want me to tell him. Your wife, too. He seemed to think about this for a little while, but then he made a discontented sound. No. I don't think so. They abandoned me. I told them both I was dying on the street and they didn't lift a finger to help. Forget it. I'll stay back here. It was a comfortable enough spot, just a little cold. You can just get used to me. Or not. By that point, I had finally pulled into the parking lot outside my building. Realizing he wasn't going to let me help him, I turned the car off and got out, grateful to leave him behind. He stared at me from the back seat, watching me go, his cracked, blue-lipped grin never faltering, his eyes never dropping. I can't get rid of him. It doesn't matter what I do. During the day, he isn't visible, but at night, he scares the hell out of me every time I drive the car. Sometimes I begin to think maybe he's left, but then, when I least suspect it, he grips my shoulder tightly, painfully, and speaks with his raspy voice in my ear. You can't get rid of me now. You thought I was annoying before, when I came to your window at the red lights. I saw you roll your eyes at me, ignoring my suffering. Well, you can't ignore me anymore. What do you want from me? I scream that at him again and again when he scares me like this. And he always says the same thing. Change. 